Right, we're back from Japan, so excuse the attire. This was on the bed. I'm in Japan, actually, to interview the great Peter Steph the Toy, Damien De Allende, Eddie Jones, uh, Aaron Smith. We've got Brody Retallick. Uh, we meant to have Richie Mwanga, but unfortunately not. But we've got Peter Steph the Toy. That's all you need to worry about. So I got that in early. So if you want to watch that, it's going to be on Rugby Pass TV. So it's free to subscribe. Get yourself on there and you'll be able to watch that. But let's get straight down to business. Chasing the Sun 2, Episode 4 unbelievable and I know it's doing the rounds everyone's talking about it but I wanted to give my review and evaluation of it because this one got me uh, we're going to title this one scrum for South Africa and it was a fairly easy episode to unpick if I'm honest obviously starts with the end of the France match and the battle they went through, uh, the host nations, uh, the emotion around that and listening to Sia talk about feeling sorry for them because not that he knows how it feels because he's back to back winner, but he knows the responsibility Anton Dupont uh, and the responsibility of the players, especially at home. And we saw Macron and we saw the kind of landscape of things in France that they needed the World Cup. They had the World Cup, they've got the Olympics there, but they needed that win to bring the country together that has got its own troubles, like a lot of countries have at the minute. So, Sia is showing a little bit of, uh, emo- not a little bit, Sia is showing a lot of emotional intelligence. And this episode was all about the scrum and that England game uh, and the mindset around the scrum as well. So Dan Human, apologies if I've not pronounced that correctly in Afrikaans, but it reads as Dan Human, but I know it's Dan Human, who's the front row, who's the scrum coach, a former front row of the Springboks, played a little bit in France as well and drew a lot of comparisons to what I already know and what a lot of rugby fans, a lot of rugby players already know. And that's around the farming, that kind of old school farming from the farms, from the bush and that kind of hard lifestyle and how that transfers into front row forwards. We've seen it. We see the All Blacks, not just in the forwards, but across the board. Ireland as well, uh, Rory Best. Uh, just to name a kind of a headline one. Is Ty Furlong into farming? I'm not too sure. Maybe the more the modern day one. But, that, you know, that kind of old school farmer mentality, which is Dana's as well. But just around that mindset going into the scrum and how that turned the game against England around on its head. It was just, it was phenomenal. Like the lead up to the England game, you actually saw they spoke about the mental fatigue going into that. And you saw it on the pitch. I actually forgot how wet the game was. I, I forgot how bad the conditions were. But South Africa knew exactly how England were going to play, the kicking game, physically. But it still shocked them. You could see when they were talking about it, you actually saw it when I watched it live. You could see the South Africans emotionally just weren't at the races. Physically, they had that big game. How do you build yourself up after that epic quarterfinal win against France in Paris? Uh, and it was tough. Like England were on the... On the up, they were on the rise, and I kind of said in the build-up, even though it said in the chase in the sun, like, how do you beat a top-four side? I actually went on to say that England were primed in that game because of the game plan that they had, and we've seen England beat Ireland recently, and they gave, obviously, South Africa a scare. But England were brilliant. Perfect game plan for them. Maratoji, George Martin, Ben Earl, Courtney Laws were absolutely huge. And it was just interesting to watch the kind of dynamics of the players talking about that. And we'll get onto the halftime speech soon. But more around Manny Leboc, uh, 32 minutes in, gets subbed off. And all I can say about Manny Leboc when I watched that was the measure of the man. Because it took a man to take it like a man and take it how he did. And he speaks about team first um, and the importance of... South Africa coming first in that moment. It was obvious Manny was having an off day, right? But he got the spring box to that point. You've got Andre Pollard on the bench. He'd played in World Cup finals at World Cups before. So he was the right man to come on. But you could only feel, having been in a similar position, obviously not in a semi-final of a World Cup, but being yanked off early, you do, you feel embarrassed. Um, you feel flat. But the way that he t- took it was was like a man. So big shout out to Manny Lebot with that. Uh, but the half time, so you go into that England dominant throughout the whole game. Half time, we were all in shock, even as a neutral. Um, I, I was in shock. I couldn't believe how well England were playing and how off South Africa were. And Rassi calls it as he has done, as we've seen in all the episodes so far, levels with everyone, says, sort your shit out. 
And then it's that kind of iconic moment where Peter Steff to Toy stands up, takes the leads, um, and is asking, calling the lads out, are you scared? Like, what are we going to do? We need to fucking get out there. We need to man up. We need to front up. Otherwise, we're out of the World Cup. And you saw the emotion and the smiles and the kind of, holy shit, Peter Steff to Toy's spoken. So... We need to do so. And that's what it takes, right? You can't have Sia Khaleesi, Ebenezer Beth, Dwayne Vermeulen, your leaders constantly going at it because it does come into white noise. So moments like that are so important and it cleared to be it clearly was an iconic moment for South Africa in that team because it was a different voice. It was Peter Steph de Toy, who, as we know, has huge influence over that group. A different team ran out. So the champions, it felt like the champions were running out. So there was this different vibe going into that second half. Uh, some big calls made by the coaches. Obviously, Manny Lebok, Andre Pollard, to bring him on was their kind of headline one, but they subbed off Sia early. They subbed off Dwayne Vermeulen early, and they brought on Quagga Smith, who was just a money ball for the Springboks in the World Cup. Obviously, big turnover in the game against France, and Dion Ferry as well. Dion Ferry, the kind of unsung hero, and we know his story is going to explode in the next episode, but they game changers for them. And that's what they always speak about, the squad, the bomb squad, but the unsung heroes in Quagga Smith and Dion Fury, I don't think will go unnoticed in the next episode, but they were massive. Um, then the rest follow. So the farmers come on, Oxen Che, uh, his story was absolutely amazing from the farm, uh, his relationship with his family, with his heritage, and his mindset as well. This is and this for me is where the episode changes, and you really see the power of the relationships between the players and the coaches. So between Dan and between Ox, that relationship that's been built over years, that trust that's been built over years, is undeniable. It's unbreakable, and I will go on to talk a little bit more about that at the end of this episode review because that's what really got me as a man and you're starting to see them relationships unfold between the team where it's more than rugby it's more than a coach and a player it's deeper than that but Ox comes on scrum starts to go forward it starts to become aggressive he's hammering Carl Sinclair poor Carl Sinclair and that is the turning point of the momentum of the energy in the team you can see that you saw it at the game, if you watched it on TV, I was pitch side for it. I felt it. You could see, here we go. And as much as England would have prepped for that, bringing on Ellis Genge, bringing on Carl Sinclair, there was nothing they could do about it. Vincent Cock played with them at Saracens, fantastic player, with Bongi, with Oxenche. It just felt like this avalanche was coming and England started to play a little bit more cagey uh, and the scrum became a lot more influential for South Africa, as we'll get into. Big momentum shift, as we saw... The African Viking, Ragnar. Who is Ragnar? It's R.G. Snyman, but they're calling him Ragnar, so who am I to argue? But that was pretty cool. Uh, and I interviewed him after the game as well, which was just epic. Didn't know what I was going to say to him. It was a bit impromptu, but the size of the human. And just imagine bringing someone like R.G. Snyman. But that was off the back of the scrum, the line-out drive, Dean Faree around the corner, and then R.G. Snyman, which was the game-changer. Because then, from then on, the rest is basically history. Get the ball back, they get a scrum penalty on halfway, which was the iconic moment, right? That was the iconic moment from that game, was that scrum penalty, if you're a purist like me. If you're not a purist, and you are a casual fan, it was the moment that Andre Pollard stepped off, come off the hour, come off the man. And people talk about, in other sports, don't they? They talk about, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Lionel Messi, Tiger Woods. In the moments that are the most important, it's the stuff of legends when they step up. And you have to put Andre Pollard in that conversation of a legend of sport. Back-to-back -back World Cup winner, comes off the bench, wasn't even in the squad at the start, and then comes on to produce that moment there. And I interviewed Andre at Leicester, it's on Rugby Pass TV if you want to go and see it. And I asked him, I said, talk us through your mindset in that moment when you're about to take the kick. You must be shitting yourself. And he said to me, with a wry smile, and he's cool as a cucumber, what a bloke, he said, 
All he was thinking about how cool it would be if this kick went over. Well, as we know, the kick went over and it was one of the most iconic World Cup games we've ever seen. And it was because of the ebbs and the flows, the dominance that England had, but then how the scrum came back to bite England because we remember 2019 when the scrum was hosed and that's basically what won South Africa the game. This is what won South Africa the game again, was the dominance of the scrum in the second half and obviously the great Andre Pollard coming on. And he's just a legend, isn't he? Just a lovely bloke as well, just a great human. And that brings us on to the to the bit that really has made me think, stand back and go up to another level. I didn't think there was another level of kind of love and energy and respect for Rassi Erasmus and Jacques Nina, but I thought I'd reached the ceiling. I haven't reached the ceiling. I hadn't reached the ceiling. I, you know, is this the ceiling now? Because... People are messaging on social media, waiting till you see episode four. It's emotional, like it's tears, like, oh my God, like you can see the interaction. So you know something big's about to go down. But this is what I got most out of it because the changing room at the end, we see Bongi and Banambi go in and he's emotional, he's crying, and Rassi speaks about it on the dock and he talks about the pressure that he's been under and leading the country, probably not playing as well as he wanted to and the relief. And he just lets him be. He lets him be. And then Bong- Bongi stands up and just goes to put his arm on the back of Rassi Erasmus and then they embrace. And for me, when I'm looking at that, that's what got me emotional because we're not seeing a coach and his player. We're seeing a man and his son. We're seeing a son of South Africa and a dad of South Africa. We're seeing brothers. And out of all the episodes, this is what got me the most because the documentary and the story isn't just about rugby. You know, Chasing the Sun, the way that it's titled, you go into their backstories. Yes, rugby, of course, it's about rugby, but it's not all about rugby. This is what I've taken out of it personally. This is a story about men. This is playing the toughest sport on the planet. And I don't like saying this. I actually don't like talking in this way because a lot of people do a lot of work in the journalistic world. A lot of people involved in the game have never played the game. And I get that. But this is true to me. Unless you've put your head in the fucking spokes, you don't really know. You don't really, really know. Okay? This is more than rugby. I've just... I'm trying to contextualise it because... This is about a sport full of warriors. Rassi's been there. Rassi's done it. He's done it for the Springboks. He knows what it feels like. He knows what it takes. He understands the pressures that these players are on. But for me, what I got out of this as a father, as a man, as a man as we kind of migrate through this world where sometimes you can't stand here and sit here and say, I'm a man. And that's a powerful thing and that's a good thing, especially the way things are now. But... This was an important moment in this because for me, it shows the importance of male role models. Male male role models and also the power of sport. So episode four of Chasing the Sun 2, here from Japan, I was watching it. What can I say? Scrum for South Africa, you legends.